It's Mother's Day, and a quick little fact for you is in Mexico, they celebrate Mother's Day every year on May 10th. So the day changes, but the date doesn't. So it's kind of special that it's on uh, the same day that we celebrate it. So happy Mother's Day. Um, we're all connected to the word mom in some way. Maybe you are a mom. Maybe you long to be a mom. You have a mom. You had a mom. <laughs> Maybe you were a mom. Maybe you're a grandmom. <laughs> but this day also brings mixed emotions as well. And it's not always a happy day for everyone. But I want you to know that you could be rest assured in God's wondrous love. And Spike just sang about that wondrous love for us. I want to tell you about a great opportunity where you can experience God's wondrous love. This Wednesday, we're going to have a time of prayer. It's called the Emmanuel Prayer. And Emmanuel simply means God with us. 
and this is going to be led by Marty. You saw him last week in our video, and he did a wonderful job leading us through that prayer. So this week on Wednesday at 1230, we are going to meet on Zoom together, and we are going to experience this Emmanuel prayer. So you'll see in the chat box there is a Zoom link. What you can simply do is copy that Zoom link and paste it somewhere in a document or a browser where you can access it. And I'm pretty sure that this week we will also post it on social media. So be on the lookout for that as well. Now, what I'd like to tell you also about the Emmanuel prayer is it's going to be a guided prayer. So Marty will walk us through on the process. This is open to anyone, so we encourage you to invite your friends to experience this. It won't be long at all. It's, you know, about 15 minutes maybe. So we hope that you'll join us this Wednesday for the Emmanuel prayer. All right. Well, when we're together, we always get to fill out that Connect card. And now that we have our um, church online, we don't get to hear from all of you. So I'm really encouraging you and hoping you that you would fill out that Connect card this week and just let us know how we can be partnering with you. Um, let us know anything that we could be praying about as well. I also want to talk a little bit about giving. When we're uh, in this place, it's easy to forget to give. And actually, I don't do a recurring give online. Um, but I forgot to submit my giving as well. So setting up your giving online will help us to remember not to forget. And we are just relying on your generosity during these times when we can't be together. There's a quick video that I want you to go ahead and watch on how to give online. So go ahead and sit back and take a look at this video. We've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it. We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in. Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history. Hey, this is Ron here with uh, another brief update on our 6K run. Listen, we are partnering with World Vision to answer a crying need in our world, and that's the need for clean water. And we are raising funds, even in the middle of this uh, COVID time, we are raising funds to drill a clean water well in some portion of the world where the average person walks approximately six kilometers or about four miles to get any form of water. And unfortunately, sometimes it's even lethal. So COVID is telling us, no, you can't do a 6K run, which is what we wanted to do. But you know what? COVID cannot and should not stop us. We can do something about this. So we're going to do some creative fundraising. So here's what we've done. We've gone to World Vision. We've set up a New Life page. It's set up in the name of our captain, Malia Marshall, so that anybody can donate through her page and it gets automatically credited to New Life. It's all tax deductible and any donation of any size. So now listen, there are three ways that you can join in. The first one is, uh, but you have to join in between now and, and uh, Saturday, May the 16th. So here are the three ways. Number one, you can just donate. You go to the, you go to the link that you should see uh, on this uh, social media post and uh, you click the donations button and you can donate any amount and it automatically gets categorized right 
and you get a receipt for it. Another thing you can do, instead of running 6K, you can do six of anything, maybe strenuous or funny or whatever, and get your friends to sponsor you. Remember the old ice bucket challenge where um, people would sponsor you for a hundred bucks and they could dump a bucket of ice water on your head? Well, it's similar to that. Get your friends to sponsor you to do six things. Film yourself doing it. Send the video to them. Send the link to them. And, and they can hit the donations button and they can donate uh, whatever they have agreed to donate for you. And then last of all, you can challenge three friends to do what you're doing. To get their friends to sponsor them to, to uh, make a video of them doing six whatever things. And, and so forth and so forth. This can go out as many generations as we want it to. But here are the key things. Number one, we can do something now. And number two, let's do it together. My mom is great because she snuggles me in my bed. I, she reads to me, I read to her. I love you, Mom. Our mom is great because she looks out for our needs. My mom is great because she gives great hugs and she takes care of me when I'm sad and she makes awesome food. My mom is great because she's loving, caring, and so patient when she does math with me every day. We love our mom because she's so beautiful, loving, and kind. And she gives us more than one dessert. My mom is great because even though she has a lot of work, she's always available to us. Our mom is great because she lets us eat pizza every Friday. Our mom is great because she has a big heart. My mom is great because she has a big heart. Our mom is great because she has the best smile and her laugh is always contagious. And she loves us even on our worst days. Love you, Mom. Love you, Mama. My mommy is great because she, she helps me when I get bored or when I get sad. My mom is great because she gives kisses to me and cuddles me when I'm scared. She also does not starve me and she is, um, lets me play video games. My mom is great because she feeds me and gives me responsibilities. Because she cares me and she loves me because she sees me a lot by and I love her because she kisses me. My mom is great because she always supports me. My mom is great because she is nice to me and she snuggles with me every night. My mom is the best because she always puts others first. And she always makes us try new things. <laughs> we love you, Mom. Our mom is great because she... <laughs> Um, she's also great because she's strong. My mom is great because she's my best friend and has always been my biggest supporter. Thanks, mom. My mom is great because she gives me ice cream. My mom is great because she supports me and by driving me swim every day and she makes the most delicious meals for us every night. She helps me with my homework Cuddles me on the couch and does all the toys. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. Our mom is great because she cares for us a lot. Our mom is great because she cooks really good. Our mom is great because she helps us grow into the women we are today. My mom is great because she loves me. My mom is great because she is generous, kind, and loving. It's so amazing, I can't believe it. Last week, Ron suggested that we not just survive in this COVID-19 quarantine, but that we could actually thrive, that there was something that we could actually um, grow in this time. And so um, this is a song that kind of encapsulates that concept of not just surviving, but actually thriving. Here 
in this worn and weary land where many a dream have died. Like a tree planted by the water, never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to Into your word we're digging deep To know our Father's heart Into the world we're reaching out To show them who you are So living water flowing through God we thirst the more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls With one desire Joy unspeakable, faith unseekable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable. Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide. We know. Well, good morning, new life. How are you doing? How's it going for you? It's a, it's a give or take for me. Depending on what day you're talking to me, maybe even what moment of the day you're talking to me, I'm, I'm having a good time. I'm having hard times. Uh, this week in particular, it's been a little tough for me. Uh, just trying to figure out how to be me with you from a distance. It's not easy. Uh, it's definitely not how I thought all of this was going to unfold and go down. And, and yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but have you noticed that sometimes those times in life when, when you're experiencing pressure, that's, that's the time when things are produced in your life? I'm not saying I enjoy those times. Like there are seasons in my life I never want to repeat again. 
I think I'm living one of those seasons. I think maybe we all are. Like, I, I think we could all be so glad when we can say 2020 is in the rearview mirror and we've got our vaccine or whatever we need to start moving into the, the normalcy of something new. But man, what I know about the seasons in my life, the, those hard ones, they always seem to produce something in me whether it was a, a deeper sense of empathy towards other people because I experienced something that they've also experienced or, or maybe it's a new relational depth that I have because I've just I've gone through the, the trenches of some kind of warfare of life with another person and it's just made us deeper together or, or somehow through the hard thing I went through, God produced a new strength in me. And yet those seasons are rarely ever present pleasant. I, I think sometimes when I'm going through them, I, I kind of feel like a, like a diamond in the rough. Uh, I feel like that because in some way, I know I'm supposed to be better than I am. I know I'm supposed to be, well, kind of glorious. I mean, I'm created in the image of God. So are you. That, that, that should mean there should be some dazzle and sparkle and greatness about us and and yet when i'm going through the pressure of hard things i rarely feel pretty <laughs> i feel kind of kind of like a hot mess <laughs> i don't know i don't know how you're feeling but man that's how it feels at times and and yet there's something interesting when you think about the beauty of diamonds like a diamond's real beauty is revealed when it reflects the light that's shining on it. And I wonder if maybe that's kind of what God's wanting to do in us in this season, in this time of pressure, is to, to produce something beautiful in us as His light shines on us. See, and I, I think in a lot of ways, Joseph, Joseph was kind of like a diamond in the rough. And, and one of the reasons we've been just spending time unpacking his story and looking at what he went through is, is so that we could have a feeling of hope in our stories today. Like if God could work in that guy's story in the situations he went through, then, then maybe I can have hope that God can do the same for me now in this story I'm living. And so as we get back into Joseph's story today, we're, we're going to see some, something really extraordinary about Joseph that... I think actually reveals something incredible about God and the work God was doing in Joseph's life. And, and so if you're not too familiar with the Joseph story, I would just encourage you to do a couple of things. One, get a Bible, download the app, and just read Joseph's story. It's in the last part of the first book of the Bible in Genesis. Go see the cartoon that was made several years ago or catch up on our series. Go, go listen to the previous teachings to kind of catch up. But, but Joseph, when we meet him, he's a 17-year-old kid living with a silver spoon in his mouth, dad's favorite, older brothers can't stand him because Joseph is kind of taken with himself. He's got these dreams of greatness that were God-given dreams, but in his immaturity, he can't handle them. And he's just kind of flaunting it to his brothers until they say, we're done with you, little bro. And they sell him as a slave to Egypt. I mean, talk about family dysfunctional dynamics. And so now Joseph is lost to everyone and everything he ever knew and finds himself caught up as a slave living in Egypt and serving with, for this guy named Potiphar who was captain of the, the guard of Pharaoh's palace. And, and Potiphar's wife took interest in Joseph and Joseph did the right thing and said no, but she spun a story, gets Joseph in trouble, wrongfully accused. Now Joseph goes from being a slave to now a prisoner in the palace prison. And what we saw happen last week is that in that place, God was still at work in Joseph's story. Joseph had this ability as God worked to, to help explain what dreams meant for people. And he met two of Pharaoh's top, top aides. And they both have these disturbing dreams. And so Joseph said, well, tell me your dreams. He's like, that's God's business, but I know God, so let me maybe help you. And, and so they each tell him their dream. And Joseph's like, hey, this is really good for one of you and really bad for the other one. One of you, Pharaoh's going to actually kill you, but the other, other, other one, he's going to reinstate. And... And so the one who gets reinstated is Pharaoh's cupbearer, the guy that drinks his cup to make sure it's not poison. And what, what Joseph asks this guy is, hey, would you, would you remember me when you get back to that place? Because I'm not supposed to be here. And yet this is how the chapter ends. It says that Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. 
And man, that's what life can feel like a little bit right now. Like, I just kind of feel like I'm being forgotten as life is closing in around me. And this is where Joseph was at. And, and so the next episode, chapter 41 starts, and this is what we see going on. It says, two full years later. I mean, catch that. Joseph is forgotten in prison for two full years. So two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. And we're told that Pharaoh has kind of two dreams back to back, kind of two nights in a row, and, and they involve seven good things and seven bad things. So the first dream is seven really, really like big cows that are just full of meat and vibrant in life. And then suddenly seven very sickly cows come up and devour the seven healthy cows. And he doesn't know what to do with this dream. And the next night he dreams of seven, seven heads of grain that are just, again, ripe and full. And, and yet seven kind of sickly, diseased grain come and swallow up those seven grain. And so he's confused. He doesn't know what to do. And, and we're told that the next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dream. So he called the magicians and wise men of Egypt. And when Pharaoh told them his dreams, no one could tell them what they meant. And so finally, the king's, chup, uh, the, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. And he says, today I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. He's like, oh, I forgot about Joseph. Which, I mean, I don't blame him in some regards. It's not like you want to go up to Pharaoh and say, hey, remember that time you were angry and you threw me in prison and you were maybe going to kill me? You're probably not wanting to bring that up on a daily basis. But suddenly he remembers Joseph can handle dreams and Pharaoh needs help. And so he explains everything to Pharaoh, what happened and how Joseph met him and everything Joseph explained in that dream came true. And, and so Pharaoh's desperate right now. No one can help him. He's like, okay, go get this guy from prison. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once and he was quickly brought from the prison. And after he shaved and changed his clothes, because you're, you're probably not smelling too good or looking too good, two years plus in prison. I mean, it's kind of how we're all starting to look in quarantine right now. I'm hoping that I can get a haircut soon because this is not a good thing for me. <laughs> and so Joseph gets all groomed to go meet Pharaoh. And he went and stood before Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. And so catch this. This is it. This is Joseph's big moment. I mean, the whole movie has been moving towards this moment where he's going to stand before Pharaoh. And, and so you think like, Joseph, do not blow this moment. This is your opportunity. If there was ever a moment to have your resume ready with all your abilities and skills and assets and to have all your references ready to go and to say, Pharaoh, look, that guy right there, he knows I can do this. Pharaoh, I'm your man. And yet, look at what Joseph does. He says, it's beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied. And I'm like, are you stupid? What are you saying? And he goes on, he says, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. And see, this is amazing to me because what Joseph does in this moment defies all our modern conventional wisdom of self-promotion. I mean, th this flies in the face of everything, like fake it till you make it and, and just kind of power through it. And one day you'll start to act the way you're supposed to be. Joseph doesn't play any of those games. He just simply says, I, I actually can't do that, but God can. And if you want, God can help you. Because I think somehow Joseph knew and understood something. I think he understood that the greatest thing he could do in this moment, the greatest thing he could do with his story is point to the greatest person who was at work in his story. I think, just, I think Joseph understood that this wasn't a moment to flaunt his own greatness. This was a moment to reflect God's greatness. And so he says, Pharaoh, I, I can't do this, but God can. He can set your heart at ease. And so he says, tell me your dream. And so Pharaoh lays out all the dreams, and, and God's at work with Joseph in a story and helps Joseph to understand the meaning of the dream. And Joseph says, okay, Pharaoh, here's what's going to happen. So the seven cows and seven heads of grain, that represents seven years of bounty and harvest and plenty. But on the other side of that, there's going to be seven years of famine and hardship, and it's going to go very bad. So I would recommend that you find someone you could trust who would work really hard in those seven years to, tist, to do good, to store grain, to store food, so that Egypt is taken care of in those second set of seven years. And so Pharaoh hears what Joseph says and seems to come to an agreement with him. He says, I, I, that sounds like a great idea. Why don't you do that? <laughs> and so we're told that Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
I hereby I here put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, says to Joseph, I'm Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. And then suddenly Joseph goes from the prison to the palace in the blink of an eye, and he's made second in charge of all of Egypt. I mean, this is his redemption moment. And you keep reading in chapter 41, and you, he, he, he finds his wife, and he starts his family, and he starts to live his best life for the next several years in this moment. And, and yet what's amazing about seeing God in his story in this moment, we suddenly see God's brilliance in Joseph's story. Because he always God at work in his story all along. So Joseph, I'm giving you dreams because I want to do something through your life. And then life takes a dark turn. And Joseph's now sold as a slave. He heads off to Egypt. And he just happens to be purchased by a guy named Potiphar, who's captain of the palace guard. So when things go wrong in Potiphar's house and Joseph is wrongfully accused, he's, he's thrown into prison. But not just any prison. He's thrown into the palace prison where he now has direct access some of Pharaoh's closest advisors. And see, so when we step back and look at this story in this moment, we realize that God was with Joseph every step of the way. God was leading Joseph every single moment closer to his destiny. God was positioning him through every difficult moment so that he would be able to step into his greatness. The, the greatness that Joseph had first dreamed about when he was a 17-year-old punk living on dad's farm. And see, I think what's so amazing to me, what I love so much about Joseph, one of the things I, I just appreciate about him is how we see in his story how he held on and, and held fast to God despite every dark turn that took place. That, that somehow Joseph knew that God was with him and that God was for him and that nothing was beyond God's ability to work for good in his story. And so when the time came for Joseph to step out of the darkness of prison into the, the full light of the palace, but Joseph didn't have to fight for that moment. He didn't have to clamor for it. All Joseph had to do as he was stepping into that moment was point to the one who had been at work in his story all along the way, every step of the way. And see, I think Joseph shows us something so beautiful about God and his relationship with him. And I think this is what Joseph shows us. Shows us that God gets the glory when you point to him in your story. Now think about that. God gets glory when you and I are willing to point to him in our story. As we're telling our story to other people, and it doesn't have to mean weird, like weird Jesus-y kind of stuff, but just like, yeah, let me tell you what, what God's done in my life. And when we do that, God gets the glory, which might sound weird. Because I don't know, maybe you're thinking, well, but I, 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 I kind of would like to be the hero of my story. I kind of want the glory for my, it seems like God's kind of a glory hog. He just wants to use me to get glory. And, and yeah, listen, listen, you want God's glory in your story. You want God's glory on full display in your life. And here's why. You and I, we were meant for glory. Like we were meant to know and see and experience God in all his glory. To, to know him in all his breathtaking beauty and wonder and awe. And see, because that's one of the reasons God created us in the first place. He created us in His image to be like Him so we could reflect Him to the world around us, but so that we could also be in relationship with Him. And knowing God, like experiencing God, would be our greatest joy in life. Because no thing and no one is as great and glorious as God, which means that the greatest thing God could ever give us is himself and he made us for him so we could know him so you know that feeling you get whenever you experience something beautiful or magnificent in life like maybe you're driving along the coast and it's it's evening and the sun is setting you just have to pull over and take in the epic skyline and something catches in your breath or, or like our family we've just discovered Sausalito and so 
We've done some sheltering in place drives down there just to take in the beautiful vista. And there's something glorious on a clear day when you're looking across the bay and you see the bridges and you see the city in the distance. And, and there's just something in you that just says, this is so huge. Or maybe it's the time when you just had a really good meal, like Cinco de Mayo. We went and got Elroy's. And I'm telling you, that's the greatest proof of God's existence, that Mexican food exists. <laughs> And so we just had some good margaritas and tacos, but there was just something so good about that meal we had together. Or maybe you just had a beautiful conversation or a beautiful day with a friend and, and you're just reflecting on it and you just think like, I, I don't know if it could get much better than this. See, there's something about those moments that stir something up within us. It, it's almost like it awakens an ache or a longing we all have. This, this ache or longing we have because we realize that we were meant to know and experience true beauty and, and wonder and awe. And see, I think the reason we have that longing within us is because we were created to know God. And I don't know where you're at in your story of faith, but I would just encourage you to, to listen to that longing. Because if you follow it, it might possibly lead you to the one who created you for it. I love how one of the ancient saints says this. St. Augustine, he writes his words. He says, speaking to God, he says, You made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. I love that because I think there's something beautiful about all those other things, but all those other things really only do is awaken that hunger. It's like scratching the itch, but they don't fully satisfy they don't satisfy and fulfill us because only God can do that. And I love that this is what we discovered Jesus came to do for us. That he came to, to restore what was lost, to bring us back into right relationship with God. That in overcoming our, our sin and our mess, he heals the brokenness that exists between us and God. And he brings us back into relationship with God. And I think this is such the wonderful thing about encountering Jesus is that he calls us to follow him back into that relational reality with God once again. And see, in Jesus, our deepest longings begin to find their fulfillment because he's leading us back home to God once again. One of the early Christian leaders, a guy named Paul, understood this in his own experience and he was writing to some of the first Christians to help them grab hold of this reality they were beginning to experience as well. And so in Colossians 3, one of his letters to the first Christians, Paul writes this. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ. I mean, like if, you, if you've stepped into this new life Jesus offers you, you've been raised into something new. It's a totally new kind of life. It's no longer a broken life. It's, it's a life that's being healed and restored. So he says, since you've been raised to this new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Paul says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And by that, he doesn't mean listen to neglect the reality of this world, but what he means is don't be taken with the things of this world that you think they're the main event. Think about who God is because he's the main event now. He says, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share Listen to what he says. You will share in all his glory. Think about that. Like when Jesus shows up in your story, it's not because he wants to share a little bit of something good with you. He wants to share all of his goodness with you, all of his greatness, all of his glory. And he shares that with us because he wants to invite us back into this greater life with him. And see, when God gets glory in our stories, it's so that we can experience more of God in our stories. And so with Jesus, our future is bright and it's brilliant because he's at work in our stories today, leading us into a greater day that's coming. Which means that there's never a time in your story where God's not at work, right where you're at. No matter how hard or difficult it is, he is at work in your story because he wants to lead you into his glory. 
That means even today, right now, God's at work in your story, even when it seems bleak and dark and heavy and hard. I think mean, sometimes we can say, so what's going on then? What's going on when it feels like we've been forgotten, kind of like Joseph, like life feels like a prison and I'm missing out on so much. What's going on? What if? What if God is at work right where you are, preparing you for a greater day that's coming? Like, what if the work God is doing to, in you today, God is doing in your life, in your story right now, is actually necessary in order to help make you ready so you can handle what He has in store for you? Like, what if today's pressures are our opportunities to partner with God as he prepares us for tomorrow's joy. Think about that. See, this is, I think, what we, we understand now looking at Joseph's story. Like when we first meet Joseph, there is no way he could handle what God has for him. I and mean, when we meet him in Genesis 37, he's this 17 year old kid and he's got dreams of greatness, but he wouldn't know how to handle that. Can you imagine if God took him at 17 and made him second in charge of all of Egypt? He'd probably ruin it because he wasn't ready for it. He wasn't developed for it. And yet over the next 13 years of his story, God is going to go on a journey with Joseph and he is going to refine him and prepare him for his future. And every step of the way in those 13 years, there was a never, never a moment when God was not with Joseph. He was with him on the way to Egypt. He was with him in Potiphar's house. He was with him as a slave. He was with him as a prisoner. And through it all, Joseph had a simple choice. Is he going to keep leaning into God? Is he going to keep trusting God? Even when it was hard and it didn't make sense. And in so many ways, Joseph was like a diamond in the rough that God was preparing for a glorious future. And diamonds are made beautiful through the pressure they go through. And when the time was right, Joseph's beauty was revealed as he reflected the light that was shining on him, the goodness of God that was always at work in his story, shining on him his whole life. So let me ask you something. What's the bright future that God has for you? That maybe even right now God is preparing you for? What, what's that bright future? You know what's great about that question? You don't have to know the answer to that question. Like Joseph didn't. He had no clue what was going. He did not know the answer to that story. He didn't know how his story was going to unfold. But what he did know was that God was with him every step of the way. And that was enough. That was enough for Joseph to continue trusting God. To trust him enough to be faithful in the hard times with the small things God set before him. See, Joseph gave his best in every part of his story. When he got to Potiphar's house as a slave, he gave his best to Potiphar, and he rose to the top in that context. And then when that went south, and he was wrongfully accused and threw threw in a prison, Joseph gave his best to the warden. I mean, he could have been bitter. He could have just sat in the dark and wallowed. No, he gave his best because he was going to be faithful to what God put in front of him. And then he gave his best to his fellow prisoners. Even when he was forgotten for two full years, Joseph still gave his best. So what are the small things that God has set before you right now in the midst of this hard time, in the midst of the season we're all going through? What are those things that are your opportunity to be faithful to who God wants you to become. The way you're treating the people around you, the way you're seeking to throw joy on the internet instead of fear, the way you're seeking to walk with others and encourage them to to reach out to other people. What are those small things? Because what if those small things are your opportunities to partner with God today as He's preparing you for tomorrow's joy? 
And what if in being faithful to those small things is how God is going to refine you and prepare you for the greater things He has for you? See, you and I, friends, we're God's work in progress. It's why we're told that we are God's masterpieces created new in Christ Jesus because God has things for us to do in this world. And just like diamonds are made under the pressure, this season is your opportunity to partner with God as He prepares you for tomorrow's joy. And just like diamonds shine brightest in the sun, your true beauty is always revealed by the light that's shining on you. And God is shining His light on you today. So maybe we can learn from Joseph that just because it's a hard time doesn't mean it's not a time to let God do something in us. And so if you're struggling today, I get it. Oh, I get it. I am too. And yet the hope that you and I have is that God is at work now because he has greater things for us to come. And I don't know how this pandemic is going to unfold. I don't know what the next months or the rest of this year are going to look like. But if you and I will stay faithful to him, if we will trust him, if we will hold on and we'll step up to the small things he has right now, we're going to see the incredible things he wants to do in us as individuals, in us as his church, in our city, in our county, in this coming year, in the years to come. And so I want to pray for you. I want to pray a prayer that, that God gave to ancient Israel, to the leaders in that time, to pray for their people. It's a prayer of blessing. And so I don't know if you've ever received a prayer of blessing, but it's when somebody chooses to pray something good over your life and, and you just adopt a posture of wanting to receive it. And so whatever that looks like, open your arms in this moment. But let me pray these words for you because I believe that God has good for us even in the midst of the hard things. And so here's my prayer of blessing for you today from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. And may the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. All oh, that promise of peace that surpasses all understanding, that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May you know that peace today so you could hold on and step fully into the light of everything God has for you. Amen.
New Life, thank you for joining us once again. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you back online next week.